Okay. So. Anyway, good afternoon. Uh -huh. well, my name is Evan Winger, and I guess some people will, will come here eventually. And we're going to go back. We're going to go back to 1935. And something happened in 1935, 88 years ago, that impacts you to this day. In fact, once a month, you look up, and there's a paycheck from Social Security. And that started back in 1935. The New Deal, uh, some of the things that happened, the Works uh, Progress Act, uh, Work Pays for America. And there were some things that you still use to this day from 88 years ago. The Social Security Act is signed into law, and Social Security, the first payments are made in 1937. Huey Long, he was a demagogue from uh, Louisiana, um, and people were terrified of his policies or what he talked about. But he learned how to use radio effectively, and he had all kinds of slogans. His nickname, Kingfish, came from radio. Uh, the second uh, Italian-Ethiopian war starts, Mussolini invades Ethiopia. For those who are interested, the first beer can was manufactured in 1935. Kruger's finest beer, and those are the beer cans uh, that were first used, also soda cans as well. Babe Ruth calls it quits in 1935. Porgy and Bess debuts in 1935, and it was uh, written off by critics as, we don't know what this is about. We can't tell you what it's about, is it for real or is it not? 88 years later, Porgy and Bess stands the test of time. Uh, Porky Pig debuts, the cartoon character, Porky Pig. And Mickey Mouse is in Technicolor. And also, how many of you play Monopoly? Oh my, of course. Monopoly. Yeah. Monopoly is first sold in 1935. 1935, the Atlantic City version of it. But uh, the 1935 is about Hitler amassing power and becoming more and more and more powerful. But to understand why Hitler became more powerful, you have to go back to the end of World War I in 1918 and how Europe was divvied up by the Americans, by the Italians, by the French, and by the English. Uh, Europe goes to war, 1914, and the war ends in 1918. Uh, the First World War and its subsequent peace settlements gave rise to new ambitions, new rivalries, new tensions. And people had high expectations that post-World War I that the peace settlement would create a new world order. That's a phrase that's been bandied about by politicians who either liked a new world order or hated a new world order. Uh, anyway, the uh, thought was, we can't have the slaughter of World War I ever again. Well, these are the four guys who divvy up Europe. And uh, the guy here on the right is Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, joined in that picture by David Lloyd George of Great Britain, Vittorio Orlando of Italy, and George Clemenceau of France. And they're the guys who are going to decide how the world, at least Europe, is going to look in the future. Uh, Treaty of Versailles signed in June of 1919, and it creates the League of Nations, an international body uh, intended to promote peace and prevent war. But the United States never joined the League of Nations. So um, one of the great powers of the world, the United States, is not part of this. Uh, the treaty was an uneasy compromise between the victorious allies, Britain and France and America and Italy, and uh, they really go their separate ways after the treaty is signed. Germany, well, they're the losers in World War I, and uh, they have to give up territory, and they have to disarm. They have to disarm. They cannot have an air force, no more Red Baron, and they can't have an army. Uh, and they have to pay for the war's damage. And uh, these divisive conditions uh, were criticized as overly vindictive by some in America and some in Britain. 
And the uh, treaty's terms caused immediate outrage in Germany, particularly among the warriors who fought for the German side. In particular, one warrior who is from Austria. And there he is, Adolf Hitler. But there's an irony of all this after the Treaty of Versailles. Actually, Germany emerges, at least militarily, stronger. Um, they have a better geo-strategical uh, position because there are new countries that are uh, formed uh, to their east, which includes Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Baltic states, and they have buffer zones between them and their traditional rival, the Russians. Uh, fighting among the new states uh, weakened them. They had strange borders, uh, which made it difficult to defend. And Germany would end up with these small, weak countries on its eastern border. <coughs> Treaty of Lausanne, signed uh, in 1923, Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, the uh, end of uh, the, really, the people who worked on it, uh, on the Treaty of Versailles, uh, comes in June of 1919, and for the next four years they're figuring out are the treaties. Treaty of Lausanne signed by France, Britain, Italy, Japan, Greece, and Romania, and the new Republic of Turkey, the former Ottoman Empire. So we have the question here, why did this Austrian Hitler fighting for Germany hate the Jews? And this is a stereotypical 1920s, 1930s European cartoon. Not sure if this is a man or a woman. Jewish star on the t on the hat, stab in the back, and it might be a woman because this character has cleavage. Stab in the back. That's what it was called. And Hitler bought into it. During the First World War between 1914 and 1918, Hitler, an Austrian, was a soldier in the German army. At the end of the war, he couldn't believe that Germany lost. And he wasn't the only one that couldn't believe that Germany lost. He couldn't get over the defeat of the German Empire. The German military spread the myth, the big lie. It was a big lie. It was a myth. Hey, we were too good to lose on the battlefield. Somebody else, somebody else caused us to lose because we couldn't lose on the battlefield. We were betrayed. But who betrayed them? Who betrayed the Germans or the Austrian Hitler? Ah, the stab in the back. Uh, that's what it was called at the time. And Hitler buys into the myth. He buys into the lie. If you tell a lie enough, according to Goebbels and others, if you tell a lie enough, it becomes the truth. Well, the Jews had betrayed Germany, the communists. And who were behind the communists? Karl Marx whose ancestry was Jewish, he wasn't, and Leon Trotsky, 1917 in Russia, Bolshevik Revolution, the communists. They betrayed the country, and they brought a left-wing government to power that wanted to throw in the town. So Hitler, here's this guy who's really an obscure nobody, he paints houses. Uh, he writes this book, My Struggle. What was his struggle? What was his struggle? Well, he was on the losing side during World War I. Mein Kampf, my struggle. Hitler predicted a general European war that would result in the extermination of the Jewish race in Germany. Mein Kampf was written in jail, 1923, 1924, after Hitler was arrested because he participated in a beer hall push in Munich, November 9th, November 10th, 1923. That's when the Nazi party tried to overthrow the legitimate German government. But Hitler is released from jail in December 1924. And I wonder if he was still in jail, if the world would have been a different place. But he wasn't. This, this is the gang. The gang. The Nazis. Misfits. Near the bees. They hated Jews, along with Hitler. 1922, the Nazi party members. He blamed the Jews, and the Germans blamed the Jews for the defeat, and Hitler created a stereotypical enemy. In the 1920s, in the 1930s, Germany, the defeated country, was in, in a major economic crisis. 
According to the Nazis, expelling the Jews was the solution for all of the problems in Nazi Ger in Germany. It wasn't quite Nazi Germany yet. On uh, February 25th, 1932, Hitler, who was an Austrian, said, no, no more, no more, no more. I'm going to become a German. Uh, and he renounced his uh, Austrian uh, citizenship in 1925. He came to Germany in 1913, uh, and he became a citizen of Germany. And he and the Nazis had a political message, the promise to make Germany economically strong again. And that won Hitler in the Nazi party the elections in 1932. Also, Herbert Hoover did something in 1932 which further hurt Germany. He wanted all the money that was owed by Germany in reparations to the United States in 1932 because the country was in the <coughs> Depression. Um, so the money came over. And that further hardened people against the West. And Hitler was able to convince the German people, we're the right ones for you. Now, Paul von Hindenburg was the guy who was the actual president of Germany. He was elderly, and he was sick. On January 30, 1933, the president, von Hindenburg, named Adolf Hitler the Fuhrer. Uh, of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, as the Chancellor of Germany. Uh, Hitler's plan was embraced by most German uh, politicians, or uh, people living in Germany, and that's to do away with politics and make Germany a powerful one-party state. Uh, 1934, von Hindenburg dies, and Hitler consolidates power uh, by becoming both the president and the chancellor. 1935, well, Hitler decides it's time to rearm. Treaty of Versailles said, no, Germany, you cannot rearm. You cannot do this. And Hitler says, eh, you know what? I'm going to. The Luftwaffe, March 11th. Uh, Hitler reformed the Luftwaffe, uh, the German Air Force, direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles. March the 16th, Hitler announces German rearmament in violation of the Treaty of Versailles. Guess what? Guess what the world did? Nothing. Nothing. They just said, okay, you're doing it, you're doing it. But in the United States in 1935, there were people that knew what was going on and became quite alarmed about what was happening in Germany. Uh, that's Avery Brundage, and this guy is Judge Jeremiah Mahoney. And he is the guy who's in charge of putting together the 1936 Summer Olympics team. And he is getting increasingly alarmed by about what's going on in Germany. Now, the first time I encountered Judge Jeremiah Mahoney was at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And there's a little area in the Holocaust Museum that honors non-Jews who served Jews well during World War II and the Holocaust. And he is one of the guys who was honored at the uh, uh, Holocaust Museum. Uh, Avery Brundage is not. He was a racist. He was an anti-Semite. In 1931, the International Olympic Committee awarded the 1936 Summer Olympics to Berlin the choice signal of Germany's return to the world community after its isolation in the aftermath of World War I. Uh, the Nazi party leader, well, that's Hitler. He became Chancellor of Germany. He turned the democracy into a one-party dictatorship that persecuted Jews, Romans, political opponents, Jehovah Witnesses. The Nazis claimed uh, that they controlled all aspects of German life and that extended to sports. The German uh, sports imagery of the 1930s uh, served to promote the myth of the Aryan racial superiority and physical prowess. Uh, tell me exactly what, when you look at Adolf Hitler, do you see being superior? Nothing. Nothing. And yet, he promotes this image in uh, sculpture and other forms. German artists idealized the uh, athlete's well-developed muscle tone and heroic strength and facial features, Aryan facial features. Aryan blue, blonde hair, blue eyes. I 
don't think that applied to Adolf Hitler, who was Austrian. Uh, this guy, his name was Eric Siegel, and uh, he was a world-class boxer. He happened to be Jewish from Germany. In April 1933, the Aryans' only policy uh, was instituted in all German athletic organizations, non-Aryans, Jews or individuals with Jewish parents. Uh, and Romans uh, were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. The German Boxing Association expelled professional light heavyweight champion Eric Siegel in April 1933. Why? He was Jewish. And so was this guy, Daniel Pran. He was a world-class tennis player. Um, he was Germany's top-ranked tennis player, and he was removed from Germany's Davis Cup team. Gretel Bergman, I interviewed Gretel Bergman in 1993 at the New York Athletic Club, um, and uh, she, uh, she was an amazing woman, actually, when you spoke to her. She fled Germany in 1937. Uh, she was a world-class high jumper. She was expelled from the uh, German club in 1933, and from the German Olympic team uh, in 1936, but they called her back. And she was in London training, but they wanted her there. And I talked to her about this, and there is a, I should tell Casey, there is an HBO special that's around called Hitler's Pawn, P-A-W-N. It's a, her life story, and it's very, very good. Uh, I, if, if you can get it around here, I strongly urge you to watch it. And I said to her, you know, 1935, when they called, 34, 35, when they called you back, why'd you go? And she said, you've got to understand something. In 1933, 1934, 1935, I had to give my people hope. We had no hope. A little ray of hope. They took everything away. They took our education away. They took our jobs away. They took our homes away. They displaced us. I knew I was never going to be part of that team, but we needed just a ray of hope, some hope, because it was so miserable what the Nazis were doing. Well, she came back. This guy is Ernest Jenke, and Ernest Jenke was once the assistant secretary of the United States Navy. He's also of German descent. In 1935, he had enough. Um, he wrote a letter on November 25th, 1935, to the International Olympic Committee President, Count Henri Belay Latour. I covered sports. I covered Olympics. Not the actual event, but the, the machinery that led up to uh, the events. And I can tell you one thing about those guys. All they care about is money. They have no principles, no scruples. So he writes a letter saying, hey, look, you know what? Uh, we should boycott these. The Americans shouldn't be there. And maybe other teams shouldn't be there. Uh, so he sends the letter saying, you know what, maybe, maybe we should boycott. The letter goes unanswered. Uh, the anti-Jewish sentiment, a picture in 1935 of Billboard talking about how horrible Jews are. Just terrible. And these people are reading it, and there's a swastika and a swastika. Uh, on uh, April 1st, the 1935, the German government banned Jehovah's Witnesses organizations. The ban is due to Jehovah's Witnesses' <coughs> refusal to swear allegiance to the state. Their religious convictions forbid an oath of allegiance to and serve in the armed forces of any power. Um, on September 15th, the German government decrees uh, the Reich Citizenship Law and the Law of, for the Protection of the German Blood and Honor. Hitler announces the measures at a Nazi rally in Nuremberg, and that is a Nazi Congress. So, <clears throat> does Jenke have reasons to be upset? Does he have reasons to say the United States shouldn't participate in anything Germany does? Well, uh, the Nuremberg race laws effectively make Jews into second-class citizens. They prohibit intermarriages and criminalize sexual relations between Jews and persons of German or related blood, the government later applies the laws to Romans, Gypsies, and Afro-Germans. Uh, and this is Belay Latour. He's the International Olympic Committee president. He's from Belgium. Uh, this is the letter. Neither Americans nor the representatives of other countries can take part in the games in Nazi Germany without at least acquiescing 
in the contempt of the Nazis for fair play and their sordid exploitation of the games. In International Olympic Committee tradition, and there's a lot of bad with the International Olympic Committee, an awful lot of bad, uh, the letter seems to go unanswered. They don't care. Well, this is uh, Judge Jeremiah Mahoney, and it's December 8, 1935. Uh, an American lawyer and a jurist. He served on the New York State Supreme Court and president of the Amateur Athletic Union. He would call on December 8th for the boycott of the 1936 Berlin Summer Games. He, in his letter, said, There's no room for discrimination on grounds of race, color, or creed in the Olympics. The AAU voted in 1933 to accept an invitation to compete in Berlin in 1936, provided Germany pledged there would be no discrimination against Jewish athletes. If that pledge is not kept, I personally do not see why we should compete. And he would go around the country trying to get support for a boycott, which he never got. But he's honored at the Holocaust Museum. Meanwhile, in 1935, Germany develops the first commercial television. And it's not there to entertain you. It's there to tell you how great Hitler is, how great Goring is, how great Himmler is, and how great the German Olympic team will be in 1936. So, basically, it's a love letter to Hitler. Uh, the first regular electronic television service in Germany began in Berlin on March 22nd. Technically, it was different. It used the 180-line system. It was on the air for 90 minutes, three times a week. And it was there for a propaganda tool. Nazi Germany planned to use television in the 1936 Olympic Games for propaganda purposes. The Nazis wanted to promote the image of a new, strong, and united Germany. 1935, anybody here own a Volkswagen Beetle? No, you did, you did. Hitler wanted a car, and he told engineers, design me a car, and design me a car that makes sense in terms of gas mileage. Whoever knew that Hitler was an environmentalist? But he was, at least for this. And these are 1979 Beatles. They lasted until 1979. Uh, Adolf Hitler wanted a cheap, simple car to be mass produced for his country's new uh, road network. Uh, in May 1934, he called for a basic vehicle that can tr could transport two adults and three children at 62 miles an hour uh, while getting 32 miles per gallon of gas. He's an environmentalist. Uh, in October 1935, the first two Type 60 prototypes, known as cars V1, a sedan, and V2, a convertible, were ready for testing. He got the Volkswagen. Well, meanwhile, in the United States, yeah, guys like Jenke know what's going on. Guys like Mahoney knows what go, what's going on. And Mahoney's allies, including Al Smith, the governor of New York, and James Curley, uh, the governor of Massachusetts all know what's going on, but uh, let's stay. Let's keep an isolationist movement going here. Let's not get involved. The Neutrality Act, August uh, 31st, Roosevelt signed the Neutrality Act of 1935, which prohibited exporting arms and ammunition to any foreign nation at war. FDR called the document an expression of the desire to avoid any action which might involve the United States in war. Hitler wins another battle. It's not a battle between armies yet, but he wins another battle. America is not concerned with Hitler's actions, not concerned that he's rearmed Germany. Well, it's still the Depression. This is Times Square. It's not New Year's Eve. It's Times Square, and that's a bread line. And I, I, my grandparents never told me about bread lines, um, for whatever reason. You might have heard from your parents about bread lines, but my grandparents never told me that these things existed. Uh, so, Roosevelt is trying to get the economy kick-started in any way, any shape, any form, and he's trying to get money to people. 
And on April 8th, uh, the New Deal, the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act of 1935 was passed. It was part of uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal designed to lift America out of the then five and a half year old depression. And one of the uh, elements here, the Works Progress Administration, USA Work Program, WPA. And you would be surprised today to learn how many WPA projects are still in use, like LaGuardia Airport. That was a WPA project. Uh, Roosevelt created the Works Progress Administration with an executive order on May 6th. It was part of his New Deal plan to lift the country out of the Depression by reforming the financial system, restoring the economy to pre-Depression levels. The unemployment rate in 1935, anybody who was a kid here in 1935? Anybody who was a kid in 1935? I was one year old. You were one, well, <laughs> you probably benefited from this. Oh. Uh, anyway, the employment rate, one out of every five was unemployed. The WPA was designed to provide relief for unemployed uh, by providing jobs and income for millions of Americans. Uh, the project, best known for its public works projects, the WPA also sponsored projects in the arts. Uh, the agency employed tens of thousands of actors, musicians, writers, and other artists to push. Here we go. This is a poster to push this program. Uh, WPA, Federal Music Project, information uh, given uh, re regarding locations of WPA schools and all subjects taught. Well, get actors out there. They need to, to work anyway, right? Musicians need to work. Let's give money to the arts. The uh, WPA oversaw a group of programs collectively known as Federal Project Number no. One. These programs employed artists, musicians, actors, and people like me, writers. Roosevelt intended Federal One to uh, put artists back to work while entertaining and inspiring the larger population by creating a hopeful view of life amidst economic turmoil. Uh, artists created motivational posters and painted murals in United States parks and American scenes in public buildings. Sculptors created monuments and actors and musicians were paid to perform. But that's not the only thing he did. How many of you here are on Social Security or get Social Security? Okay, everyone. Everyone. Me too. Me too. The Social Security Act, 1935. Uh, responding to the economic impact of the Great Depression, 5 million old people in the early 1930s joined the nationwide Townsend Clubs, promoted by Francis E. Townsend to support his program, de demanding $200 monthly pension for everyone over the age of 60. It's funny, I was listening to old time radio, I was on my, my bike listening the other day, and uh, I was listening to a clip of the Amos and Andy show, which was highly popular in, 19, in the 1930s. And they talked about, uh, hey, you know what, maybe we should join the Towson Club. Now, I never even knew what the Towson Club was. So I listened to Amos and Andy, and then I looked into it. Meanwhile, Frances Perkins, uh, she's in charge. First uh, woman cabinet officer. 1934, Roosevelt created the Committee on Economic Security and tasked them with creating an economic security bill. Led by the first woman to hold the U.S. cabinet post, which was a big, big deal back then, uh, the Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins. Uh, the e, uh, C, S, e, uh, rather the CES drafted the Social Security Act aimed at giving people <coughs> economic security throughout their lives. Uh, and this was the plan, an old age pension program, unemployment insurance funded by employees, health insurance for people in financial distress, financial assistance for widows with children, financial assistance for disabled individuals. This was a new idea. It went back to the mid-19th uh, century. So the Social Security Act is signed into law, and it would be applied in 1937. August 14th, Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act. 
The act established a permanent national old age pension system through employer and employee contributions. Oh, by the way, you hear today, you know, politicians, got to so cut Social Security, got to cut Social Security, got to cut Social Security. I get incensed watching the news because I see third rate people in Washington trying to ask questions. And I broke in in the 1970s and I was on the street with Pete Hamill. I was on the street with Jimmy Breslin and others. And World War II vets who didn't care. Who didn't care. One of the guys who taught me how to do things was a guy named Sam Hall, WNEW Radio. I was 21 years old when I started working with WNEW. Anyway, I wish these reporters would just go to Google and just read this. Social Security would be financed by payroll tax on employees and employers. A uh, number of American political leaders, including the Louisiana Senator Huey Long, were opposed to the act. Uh, after signing the Social Security Act, President Roosevelt established a three-person board to administer the program with the goal of starting payroll tax deductions for enrollees by January 1st, 1937. Not everybody qualified. Self-employed professionals, field hands, and domestic workers were excluded from the act. Well, Huey Long was assassinated, and Huey Long was one of the first political stars on radio. Now, Roosevelt knew how to use radio, fireside chats, which he started as governor of New York back in the 1920s. Well, this guy really knew how to use radio. Uh, he planned to run for president in the 1936 election, Democrat uh, primaries against Roosevelt. He had risen to national prominence with his Share Our Wealth program, which swept the nation as the Great Depression worsened. Long boasted that he bought legislators like sacks of potatoes, shuffled them like decks of cards. He called himself the Kingfish, saying, I'm a small fish here in Washington, but I'm the Kingfish to the folks down in Louisiana. And where did he get the name Kingfish from? The Amos and Andy radio show. How many of you remember Amos and Andy from either radio or TV? Amos and Andy, they came out of Chicago. Uh, Long took his nickname, Kingfish, uh, who was a character on the Amos and Andy show. Amos and Andy was a popular radio show which featured two white actors playing black men, Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll, who played Amos Jones, Gosden, and uh, Andrew Hogg Brown, uh, Corral. Uh, and take a look at all the microphones in front of Huey Long. He knew how to use the new media. Remember, these days, 1935, commercial radio in the United States is just nine years old. And people are still trying to figure out how to use radio. But by 1935, radio was the predominant entertainment forum around America. We'll say Jack Benny, among others, every week. Uh, Long was a populist politician, rose to fame in the early 1930s by mastering the new medium of radio and reaching an audience with his hopeful slogan, Every Man a King. In 1928, he was elected governor of Louisiana at the age of 34. The political machine he had developed through the 1920s now took power in the state and began to ruthlessly suppress opposition. Long advocated for better education. And unlike traditional Louisiana Democrats at the time, didn't talk about the Confederacy. He steered away from the racially charged politics uh, of the South. Uh, but he was impeached in Louisiana as governor. Um, he got a number of enemies, including wealthy executives of oil companies. A campaign to impeach him and drive him out of the governorship gained momentum. Uh, Long held on to his job as the state legislature failed to convict him. There was a rumor. Why wasn't he impeached? Paid off politicians. And then he becomes Senator Long. Uh, in 1930, he decides to run for the United States Senate. He entered the primary, beat the incumbent, and won the general election. But he wouldn't take his seat until he found a replacement as a governor. And that would take two years. Um, he controlled, after he was in the Senate, uh, Louisiana state politics and his political machine through the new governor, Oscar K. Allen. But he was frustrated by his relative obscurity in the Senate. 
So he announced this uh, plan. Let's redistribute the wealth, share our wealth. The plan proposed heavy taxation on uh, the wealthy and guaranteed government stipends for the poor. Mong launched the plan with a speech to which he rolled out a new slogan, Every Man a King. And he has presidential aspirations. Here you go, back of that spare tire, you and Long for president. To the wealthy and the powerful, Long's plan was outrageous. He was denounced as a dangerous radical. To other politicians, just a showman. Uh, Republican and Democratic politicians, alarmed by his dictatorship style as governor and his growing popularity, considered him a threat. Yet to the average American, in the depths of the Great Depression, the promises of the kingfish was welcome. The Share Our Wealth Society gained more than 7 million members around the country. And there he is, uh, surrounded by bodyguards. Uh, in the final year of his life, 1935, he faced a number of challenges to his control of Louisiana. He also claimed to be receiving death threats and surrounded himself with bodyguards. On September 8th, Long's in the Louisiana Capitol <coughs> building overseeing uh, efforts to remove a political enemy, Judge Benjamin Pavey, from office. After a bill was passed accomplishing Pavey's removal, Long was approached by Pavey's son-in-law, Dr. Carl Weiss. And there is Weiss. Uh, he lunged uh, within a few feet of Long and fired the pistol into his abdomen. Or did he? Uh, Long's bodyguard opened fire on Dr. Weiss, striking him with at least 60 bullets. Long was taken to the hospital where doctors attempted to save his life. He died 30 hours later on the morning of September 10th. The killing of Weiss. This was an artist's rendition. So did Weiss really kill Huey Long? Well, there's a different story. Uh, claims that the doctor only punched Long and that the bodyguards overreacted and Long was killed uh, in the bullets going flying. The guards were said to have covered up their reckless response by pinning the death on Weiss. To this day, nobody knows who killed Huey Long. Well, there's a second Italian-Ethiopian war, as Haile Selassie, and this introduces Benito Mussolini to the world. Uh, it starts on October 3rd. Uh, 200,000 soldiers of the Italian army attacked from uh, Eritrea, uh, an Italian colony possession without the declaration of war. Ethiopian counteroffensive managed to stop the Italian advance for a few weeks. The war would continue. Uh, Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year for standing up to Benito Mussolini. Anybody here like beer? Yeah. 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 Two women. Two women like beer. Yeah. You like it from cans? From cans or the tap? Because the first beer can rolled off the assembly line in 1935 from the American Can Company. <clears throat> Inside the can, it's keg lines. Uh, on January 24th, the first canned beer from the Gottfried Kruger Brewery went on sale in Richmond, Virginia. The American Can Company began experimenting with canned beer in 1909, but the cans could not withstand the pressure from carburation and exploded. What a waste of beer, right? Just before the end of Prohibition in 1933, the company developed a keg lining technique, coating the inside of the can, same as a keg. Kruger had been selling beer since the mid-1800s, but suffered from the Prohibition and worker strike. When American Can approached them with the idea of canned beer, it was initially unpopular with Kruger executives. But American Can said, hey look, we'll install the equipment for free. If it flops, it'll be on us. You won't have to pay for it. So they said, sure, why not? And there it is. That was the first, well, it wasn't the first one, but that was what the first beer can looked like. Uh, Kruger's Cream Ale and Kruger's Fine Beer were the first beers to be sold in public in cans. Canned beer was an immediate success. By the beginning of summer, Kruger was buying 180,000 cans a day from American Can, and other breweries decided, hey, we got to do this too. But you, how'd you open the can? You need a can opener, right? 
That's a Pabst uh, Blue Ribbon beer can opener. The first cans were flat top and made of heavy gauge steel. To open a hole, it had to be punched in the top with the sharp end of a church key style opener. Well, speaking of people who like beer, Babe Ruth says goodbye. It's 1935 and he's not wearing the pinstripes. The New York Yankees instead, he's wearing the uniform of Emil Fuchs, Boston Braves <coughs> baseball team. On February 26th, Yankees ownership uh, released Babe Ruth. The Babe quickly signed a $20,000 contract with the National League's Boston Braves. Ruth's new contract uh, with uh, the Braves also gives him a share of the team's profits. Uh, in 1934, he had a really good season for a guy 39 years old. Hit 288, hit 22 home runs, drove in 84 runs, but uh, that was not Babe Ruth type numbers. His salary was $35,000, the Yankee ownership was tired of his off-field antics and didn't want to make him the team's manager. So he said, goodbye. He went back to Boston where he started his career in the major leagues. Uh, and there he is with Emil Fuchs. Uh, as the 1934 season ended, the Boston Braves owner Fuchs, uh, financial wo woes, uh, had him searching for creative uh, ways uh, to uh, increase revenue. His bid to place a Greyhound track on Braves Field site in Boston was denied. But he was successful in his attempt to increase interest in this club by landing Ruth. Uh, when Ruth signed uh, with the team, he received $25,000 base salary and a promise to receive a percentage of the club's profits. He was named the vice president and assistant manager. Well, he's about done. There he is in Boston. Um, he's about ready to say goodbye. But he had one last hurrah. Uh, it didn't take Ruth long to realize that those titles were meaningless. Um, he had, Fuchs was keeping his manager, Bill McKechnie. The Depression of 1929 was still lingering. Fuchs saw Ruth's box office appeal as a means to help keep the business out of bankruptcy. It's Pittsburgh, and it is May the 25th, and there's one last hurrah. Uh, at Forbes Field, Babe Ruth hits his final three home runs in the game against the Pirates. Uh, he also doubled. The Braves won 11-7. He homered in the first inning, the third in the seventh inning, uh, and the seventh inning blast was his 714th career home run. He'd play five more games, wouldn't uh, get a hit, and he retires on June the 2nd. How many of you saw Porgy and Bess? You do. Porgy and Bess. How many of you listened to Gershwin? That's all I did. George Gershwin. Well, in 1926, George Gershwin read Porgy, the Boris Haywood's novel of the South Carolina Gullah culture, and he immediately recognized it as a perfect vehicle for his folk opera using blues and jazz. Porgy and Bess was co-written with Hayward and uh, his brother Ira. Gershwin's most ambitious undertaking in integrated unforgettable songs with dramatic interests. You know, songs like I Got Plenty of Nothing and Nothing's Plenty for Me, among others. Uh, Porgy and Bess proved previewed in Boston on September 30th and made it to Broadway on October 10th. It was panned by the critics. The critics didn't know what to make of it. What are you doing, George? We don't know what it's about. Is it an opera? Is it a musical? Is it a serious work? Is it a minstrel show? Oh, minstrel show. It was the first Broadway play to ever have an all-black cast. Confuse them. <coughs> Confuse Duke Ellington, too. He was dismissive of Gershwin's creation. Uh, swing music. How many of you remember Benny Goodman, the king of swing? Eh? Remember Benny Goodman? Uh, the danceable swing music of big bands and band leaders such as Benny Goodman <coughs> became the dominant force of American popular music in the swing era where people were dancing the Lindy Hop. I have no idea what the Lindy Hop is. My wife for 42 years has been trying to teach me how to do the Lindy. I have two left feet. Uh, Goodman's performance at the Palomar Ballroom in Los Angeles on August 21st is regarded to be 
the beginning of the swing era music. How many of you like swing music? Glenn Miller and all that, yeah. The verb to swing is also used as a term of praise for uh, playing that has a strong groove or drive. Uh, that, 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 that's all, folks. That's all, folks. No, it's not yet all, folks, yet. Uh, Porky Pig makes a debut. The character was created by Fritz Freeling and developed, animated by Bob Clampert for the short I Haven't Got a Hat. It was released on March 2nd. Warner Brothers studio head Leon Schlesinger suggested that Freeling do a cartoon uh, version of the popular R Gang films. Remember R Gang with Spark, Spark, Sparky Spanky and Alfalfa? Well, this was supposed to be a send up of that. Porky only has a minor role in the film, but the little fat stuttering pig stole the show. Porky's name came from uh, two brothers who were childhood classmates of Freelings, nicknamed Porky and Piggy. Uh, so Porky Pig debuts. Uh, Freeling uh, claimed to have given Porky Pig the stutter. Freeling hired Joe Darley to play Porky because he had an actual stuttering problem. However, production costs became too high when Darley could not control his stutter and many more takes would have to be made. That, 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 that's all, folks, for Darley opening uh, the door for uh, the voice actor, somebody by the name of Mel Blanc. That, 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 that's all, folks. Mickey Mouse is in Technicolor. How many of you remember Mickey Mouse? Mickey Mouse. Uh, the mouse appears in the animated short Technicolor for the first time uh, with the release of band concert on February 23rd. Mickey Mouse tried to conduct the concert of the William Tell Overture, but it is largely unsuccessful because Donald Duck gets in his way. Uh, Monopoly. How many Monopoly players are here? Quite a number. And this guy is the father of Monopoly. May have been a mother of Monopoly too, but Charles Brace Darrow is credited as the inventor of the board game Monopoly. Although the original idea for the game came from Lizzie Maggie's The Landlord Game, Darrow has been credited as the creator by Parker Brothers, the game's publisher. Monopoly is a board game which focuses on the acquisition of fictional real estate titles with the incorporation of elements of chance. After losing his job at a sales company following the stock market crash in 1929, Darrow worked at various odd jobs. Seeing his neighbors and acquaintances play a board game uh, in which the object was to buy and sell property, he decided to publish his own version of the game with the help of his first son, William, and his wife, Esther. Darrow marketed his version of the game under the name Monopoly. And he even played the game. There he is. Uh, the Parker Brothers bought the game's copyrights from Darrow when the company learned that Darrow was not the sole inventor of the game. It bought the rights to Lizzie Maggie's patent for $500. The uh, Parker Brothers began marketing the game on November 5th. It has a U.S. patent, U.S. 2026082A, in Darrow's name. That happened on December 31st, uh, and it was assigned to Parker Brothers, Inc. The original version of the game is based on the streets of Atlantic City. How many of you own a Toyota? What? Toyota car. I have one right outside. Mm -hmm. That's the for first Toyota, 1935. Mm -hmm. uh, Kiriko Toyoda traveled to Europe and the United States in 1929 to investigate automobile production and began researching gasoline-powered engines in 1930. The Toyota Automatic Loom Works was encouraged to develop automobile production by the Japanese government, which needed domestic vehicle production due to the war they had with China, which started in 1931. Uh, Toyota seized this opportunity to establish the Automotive Production Division on September 1st, 1933, and began uh, preparing to build prototype vehicles. In 1934, the division produced its first Type A engine, which was used in the first Model A1 passenger car in May and the G1 truck in August. How many of you hate parking meters? How many of you hate feeding the meters? Right? You don't like parking meters. Anybody like a parking meter around here? No. Not particularly. No. 
makes its debut. This thing made its debut in 1935. Traffic congestion uh, problems in 1920s and 1930s plagued American cities. In Oklahoma City, the problem that people who worked downtown occupied all the parking spaces every day, forcing retail customers to park far away from stores. The city had placed time limits on parking with enforcement by, uh, performed by traffic police who chopped tires, marked time, and gave tickets on uh, hourly, hour, hourly rounds. That didn't work. Uh, so, the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce in 1932 decided, let's take a close look at the problem. The chair of the traffic committee, Carl Maggie, was tasked with solving the problem. So he decided the situation required the invention of a small, windable, inexpensively made mechanical device to time the use of each parking space. He designed and built the crude model, and on December 21st, 1932, he filed for a patent. It eventually got refined. There's the guy who you need to hate. He's the guy who invented the parking meter. This guy, back here. Uh, the McNick Company of Tulsa making of timing devices used to explode nitroglycerin in oil wells contracted the manufacturing, uh, contracted to the manufacturing unit. On July 16, 175 meters were installed and tested on 14 blocks in Oklahoma City. When the system proved to be successful, the city placed meters all over downtown. And guess what? The meters spread across the country. And spread. And spread. And spread. The 1935 legacy, that's me in Germany, uh, about 10 years ago, no Nazis. German, the Germans had outlawed the Nazi party. Hitler's uh, Germany was legitimized while hosting the 1936 Berlin Summer Olympics. Germany annexed Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938, invaded Poland September 1st, 1939, started World War II, that ended in 1945. That is my son in Dallas, Texas. This is Daly Plaza. This was built by the WPA, this part of Daly Plaza. It is probably the most famous WPA project because that is where John F. Kennedy was killed in 1963. Uh, some of the other projects, uh, well, the, the white concrete colonnades and triple uh, underpass, which Kennedy went through on the way to uh, Parkland Hospital, that was part of a WPA contract uh, project. So was LaGuardia Airport. Social security remains popular with the general American population, but not so with some politicians who would like to dismantle it. Huey Long was bigger than life. Why? Because he was able to use radio and TV coverage to make a name for himself. And politicians would discover, after Franklin Roosevelt and <coughs> Huey Long, that radio would increase their recognition. Italy announced the annexation of the territory of Ethiopia May 7, 1936. The nation's leader, Haile Selassie, went into exile. He returned in 1941. Kruger, Buren Ale, and Kegline Cans. Well, the industry has boomed. The world's beer and soda consumption uses about 180 billion aluminum cans every year. 180 billion. The Bay. Well, he retired with 714 home runs. He changed the game from small ball to a power game. Great pitcher, 188 games before he started playing every day as an outfielder. He was considered the greatest player of his time when he died in 1948 at the age of 53. Babe Ruth's presence still looms large over baseball. Gershwin, self-portrait. Porgy and Bess is considered Gershwin's finest work. George Gershwin would die in 1937. His work is still considered a cornerstone of the music industry. Swing music lasted until the end of World War II. It still has fans today. That's all, well, it's almost all, folks. We've got about two more minutes. Here's Porky Pig. Porky Pig was Warner Brothers' first cartoon star. Porky was created by Fritz Freeling, then revamped by Chuck Jones. Uh, who turned him into a character actor. Daffy Duck eclipsed Porky as the Warner Brothers star by 1938. Mickey Mouse remains the Disney Company's major cartoon star. 
So strong was the Mickey Mouse character that Disney, as we called, uh, or, or Disney, the, the name of the company, the nickname of the company is called The House the Mouse Built. Uh, oh, Monopoly. Hollywood edition of Monopoly. More than 275 million Monopoly games have been sold worldwide in 111 different countries and have been translated into 43 languages. It has been played by more than a billion people. Uh, automo uh, automobile evolution estimates there are between <coughs> 4 and 5 million parking meters in the United States. Volkswagen delivered about 8.26 million <coughs> motor vehicles worldwide in 2022. Globally, Toyota sold about 10.48 million vehicles between Dece January and December 2022. Any questions or comments about the year that was, 1935, and how there's a lot of stuff still around from 1935 that you use today? Any questions, any comments? <laughs>